Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Sam Worthington at Interaction, and I have the pleasure of uh, welcoming the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Antonio Guterres. He's been the High Commissioner now for about eight years, uh, was reelected uh, for a second five year term recently uh, by the General Assembly. Um, I, I will be informal here in that we're sort of an NGO crowd and continue to call you Antonio. Uh, largely because uh, here is a gentleman who has been uh, the Prime Minister of Portugal, uh, uh, leadership on the European Council, uh, significant engagement in the Timor crisis, but who for those of us in the NGO community uh, really know more as a colleague, as someone uh, who in the UN system uh, has uh, not only made his door uh, open and available, but who has become a critical partner for us uh, and very much a leader uh, and one of the preeminent leaders in the space, uh, not only for refugees, but the role uh, of those human beings who are trying to make a real positive difference in the world. So we're gonna start off and, and uh, uh, Antonio is gonna make some broad sort of opening comments and then we'll have a, a, a little conversation up here and then we'll open it to to your comments as well. So I'll, I'll turn over to you and thank you very much and welcome to Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your very kind invitation and for this opportunity to be here with all of you. Um, the, the political philosopher that uh, has had more influence in my own thinking is the German philosopher Habermas. And uh, one of his many contributions has been to draw the attention to the fact that what is key in a modern democracy is uh, not essentially to have elections or other uh, aspects, it's the permanent interflow of communication between the political society and the civil society, and the fact that that permanent interflow of communication has an influence on the way political decisions are taken. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something that I believe uh, is also true at the level of international organizations, and namely at the level of the UN. Uh, for the UN, uh, and especially for the UN humanitarian agencies to do the job properly, they must uh, really be committed to a permanent interflow of communication with the global civil society, and interaction is a key pillar of that global civil society, and to make sure that that interflow of communication impacts on our own strategy, on our plans, uh, uh, and not only on uh, the concrete activities that we do together in many parts of the world. And so an opportunity like this one is extremely important for me. Now, uh, just a few words. Um, uh, I think that humanitarian actors are going to, fi to, f to find the next uh, two or three decades very challenging ones. And I think that uh, we are probably not entirely prepared for what is yet to come. That doesn't mean that there are not good news in the world. Uh, there are many development uh, 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 NGOs here, and the number of absolute poor in, in, in the world has decreased, especially because of uh, the amazing growth of some emerging uh, economies. Uh, it is also true that the, 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 the continent where poverty is more uh, relevant, Africa is the continent that in the last decade had the highest rate of growth, so there are also good news in the world, let's be clear, but uh, it is also true that we are facing and will be facing increasing humanitarian challenges. First of all, because of conflicts themselves. What we are witnessing in the recent past is a multiplication of new conflicts and the difficulty to end the old ones. Uh, the international community has lost part of its capacity to prevent conflict and to ensure the timely resolution of conflict. When I started my political career, we lived in the bipolar world, in the Cold War. Uh, uh, there were not a global governance system, much less a democratic one. There were many problems with the, the Cold War, as we all know, but there was a clear set of power relations. Then when I was in government, we lived the period of the American supremacy, the 90s, uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Again, one can argue uh, whether this is the best possible system in the world, but it is clear that in the absence of uh, uh, a, a global governance system, there was again a clear set of power relations. And what is true today is that we go on without a global governance system, much less a democratic one, 
But power relations became unclear. And so unpredictability became the name of the game. Things happen. And they happen everywhere in a way that nobody has foreseen that they would happen and having sometimes the, the most dramatic humanitarian consequences. Uh, uh, and what is terrible is that the capacity of the humanitarian community to prevent the conflicts is now very limited. Look at the paralysis of the Security Council facing the Syrian conflict for two years without being, being able to take any meaningful decision. And uh, 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 not only things cannot be prevented, but Afghanistan, Somalia, uh, the DRC, and many other old conflicts tend to remain and to persist and their humanitarian consequences are not improving. On the contrary, in many circumstances, they are getting worse. But if one looks at the other dimension, uh, if one looks at the global megatrends as we see them, uh, climate change, probably the most defining factor of our times, uh, population growth, urbanization, uh, food insecurity, water scarcity, we see those megatrends getting more and more interactive, uh, uh, influencing each other, enhancing each other uh, in a world that is becoming smaller and smaller, where for the first time there are physical limitations to economic growth. And we are looking at uh, the dramatic impact they have, not only in the multiplication of natural disasters that are more frequent, more dramatic, with more devastating humanitarian consequences, but also uh, in the slow onset of degradation of different areas of the world, where it is more and more difficult to sustain human life. Look at the Sahel, for instance. And, and these, again, uh, will interact with conflict, competition for scarce resources, and uh, will put people on the move. Uh, I see things from the refugee perspective, but will have dramatic humanitarian consequences. And these will tend to get worse, not to get better in the years to come, especially because, again, because there is no global governance system, no clear set of power relations, no way to make uh, uh, the international community assume a consensus on how to address these megatrends and its interaction. Look at climate change or global trade, for instance. Uh, in the absence of collective answers to these problems, they will get worse and worse in the decades to come. So my belief is that we'll be facing more and more, a more and more challenging humanitarian environment, and our organizations will be asked to respond in more and more dramatic circumstances with more frequency and uh, with a, 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 a more uh, uh, tragic uh, uh, on the lives of people. And very probably, the financial resources available to us will not grow uh, proportionally. Uh, we see now uh, a global economic uh, I mean, crisis, or uh, sometimes crisis, less. sometimes less crisis, but we see uh, a doctrine of austerity prevailing in Europe, budget restrictions everywhere, public expenditure being considered a crime in many parts of the world. Uh, we see uh, that uh, humanitarian aid budgets uh, are not growing proportionally to humanitarian needs. Uh, we see how difficult, for instance, it is to mobilize resources to address the dramatic impact of the, of the Syrian crisis. And, and, um, and my forecast is that we will be called to do more and more, I would say with less resources, but with probably uh, 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 resources that will not grow proportionally to the needs uh, we will be facing. And with also more dramatic problems of access to the people we care for in many parts of the world. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, or one of the consequences, sorry, one of the consequences of this lack of clear power relations uh, is that in the recent past, uh, and probably I'm being too pessimistic about it, I see national sovereignty gaining ground in relation to the human rights perspective. Uh, and I see more and more governments uh, uh, using national sovereignty as an instrument to deny uh, humanitarian access to populations. Uh, just recently, for instance, it was clearly said uh, by the Syrian government and then uh, reass uh, reaffirmed by the Russian government and the Chinese government that cross-border operations would be against national sovereignty and because of that, the UN should not be allowed to do so. Just an example. Um, but we have many examples of how national sovereignty is being more and more invoked to limit humanitarian action and to limit uh, the capacity of uh, uh, human rights to prevail in, uh, uh, in difficult environments uh, around the world. On the other hand, uh, even the nature of conflict is evolving. 
uh, we have no longer wars between two countries or between a government and a clear rebel movement. We have a multiplicity of actors, uh, 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 both in the DRC or in Syria or, or in Somalia. You have government troops, you have international forces, uh, you have uh, uh, all kinds of ethnic, religious, uh, political militias, you have bandits, uh, you have people that sometimes even change from morning to afternoon uh, the nature of their activity, um, uh, acting as a militia for any purpose in the morning and uh, hijacking people for uh, ransom in the afternoon. And in this context, uh, it is becoming more and more difficult for us to have access to many of the populations we need to exceed to deliver uh, according to uh, our mission. And, um, and here, uh, there, there is in the UN system today uh, a, a, and I'm going to be a little bit unorthodox on this, but a, a real risk, uh, which is the attempt to respond to this kind of environments, thinking that the solution is to integrate everything. Uh, and to, uh, to put the, 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 the political, the security and the humanitarian dimension all together in the same package, not only from the strategic point of view, but even from the structural point of view. And recently we had an example in Somalia uh, in which uh, there was a, a big discussion within the UN and I was very much uh, uh, pleading uh, to avoid the structural integration of the Somalia mission. Uh, but, uh, and in the end, uh, we managed to, uh, to have that uh, even with some I mean, uh, um, not clear perspectives about the future in uh, the proposal the Secretary General made uh, to the Security Council, but the Security Council decided that there should be today in Somalia structural integration of uh, all uh, 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 UN uh, entities working in Somalia in the context of the uh, mission that uh, the UN has uh, in the country that, as you know, is also supportive of the AMISOM mission uh, that has a clear uh, military dimension uh, inside Somalia. The difficult to make people understand at member state level, at government's level, the need to preserve the autonomy of the humanitarian space and to preserve uh, the humanitarian principles of independence, impartiality, and, in, and uh, neutrality in the way we do business, independently of the fact that there are very important political dimensions that need to be addressed by others, that there are very important even security dimensions that need to be addressed by others, and of course that we need to talk to each other and to see the implications of what we do, but preserving the autonomy of the humanitarian space is also something that now is no longer fashionable, and it's another uh, it's another um, uh, important uh, limitation or another uh, important uh, aspect of the environment that we will need to face. I don't want to be too pessimistic, but let's be prepared to face increasing challenges, increasing needs uh, in our humanitarian work. Let's be prepared to do it with limited resources and let's be prepared also to do it in an environment in which access will be more difficult and humanitarian principles uh, will not be always fully recognized by our partners and uh, 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 the other entities that are working in the same scenarios where we work. Well, thank you for that. I think that's probably one of the, the best things. Um, but I don't want to be pessimistic. I mean, no, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I mean, I think that was one of a beautiful tour of the tour d'horizon, as they say, of the sort of environment within which we operate. And, you know, you sort of look back at the, the last uh, eight years of your work at UNHCR, and you've worked a lot with the NGO community, the UN system. How has our ability to respond to vulnerable populations changed? And have we, have we increased our ability? I know resources have shifted and so forth. The world around us has shifted. To what extent and, and where are the lessons that we should take uh, out of this? I think it's important, first of all, to recognize that there has been an enormous progress uh, in the way we all are organizing ourselves. Uh, we have now uh, uh, better structures, uh, better management uh, capacities, uh, more modern tools, uh, and uh, the level of partnership within the humanitarian system has dramatically increased. Not always in the best way. I think sometimes we have uh, too much bureaucracy, uh, especially this is a very UN kind of thing. I mean, uh, not, 
not uh, as such uh, in, the, in the NGO movement, but I mean, coordination is sometimes seen within the UN as a very heavy bureaucratic mechanism instead of an added value that needs to be uh, pursued uh, with a minimum of resources and the maximum of convergence of our efforts. Uh, but uh, with hiccups here and there, I think we all need to recognize that partnership has improved, coordination has improved, and each one of our organizations has modernized itself. So I think that our re collective response capacity is getting better. The problem is that our collective response capacity is still out of proportion with the needs we face. And uh, look at the serious situation. I mean, it is obvious that, uh, uh, I mean, the effort that uh, uh, 60 partners, 60 international partners are doing to support the refugees outside with a common plan, with a common appeal, with, a, with I mean, what we do is far from being enough in relation to the needs of the people, not to mention the problems inside Syria, which, is, which are even worse. So uh, I think we need to recognize that uh, we are doing better, but we are out of proportion with the needs we face. And at the same time, I believe we need to, uh, we need to adapt to a changing world more quickly, in the sense that we sometimes do business in a very traditional way. And we don't take full profit of what technology has, uh, has uh, created in relation to uh, information technology, uh, not only from the point of view of our organizations, but from the point of view of uh, the benefit of the people, the benefits for the people we care for. I mean, we, we all know of examples of how IT is now used to allow for quick transfer of funds to uh, a better registration mechanisms, better identification of vulnerabilities, but we are still very far from using the whole set of tools of modern technology in the way we do business together. So I think there is an area where we can improve. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the other thing where I think we, we, we need to be more effective is doing common advocacy. Uh, 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 we are still very uh, scattered in, in the way uh, we do our advocacy and, uh, and, and the challenges we face are so big and the need to do together uh, is, uh, is so clear uh, that um, I think uh, for not only for fundraising perspectives but also to promote the values that uh, uh, we are uh, we, 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 that, that are dear to, to our hearts and to our mandates uh, for instance keep borders open uh, for instance uh, allow access to people uh, uh, in states people in need of protection uh, from the refugee point of view uh, and this is uh, as true for Syria as it is for Europe or uh, for the United States I mean uh, how to improve uh, uh, resettlement programs how to increase I mean there are many many things in which I believe we need to be more effective doing common advocacy having said so I think that in the UN and looking at the UN as such I think that we still have a long way to go to uh, um, uh, fight bureaucracy, uh, to, uh, to combat a certain arrogance. To, uh, uh, one of the big discussions we have with our own people within UNHCR is that sometimes our people on the ground does not understand how important for us is the partnership with the NGO movement and how strategic it is for us. And many people on the ground are still based on this idea, we are the UN, we are in command, or the others should do what we tell them to do. And this is, this is a slow process. So I think the UN has still a long way to go to fight bureaucracy and to fight a certain institutional arrogance in order to be able to fully adapt to this kind of cooperative approach that we need to have to face the challenges we are facing today. I think it was a kind of a uh, not very clear answer, but... Uh, the, the question is also a difficult one. Difficult one, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I, I mean, you've given some, some good examples of the UN and the changing. You've also worked a lot with the, the NGO community over this period. How, how should we evolve? Where are our shortcomings and where are the places where you think we should really step up? Now, I think that in relation to uh, delivery, I mean, uh, I... I most uh, probably the most effective uh, delivery agencies, the agents that exist today are uh, NGOs. And uh, there are NGOs that 
uh, I would say, uh, uh, are work better in the field than uh, most of the UN organizations. So uh, I think the, when I look at a community like the one that, uh, that I'm in front of me, I, I'm not really very worried about your capacity of delivery and your capacity to be present in an effective way in the scenarios you operate. What I think is the, the, the most important thing is we are not doing enough, UN agencies and international NGOs, to strengthen the civil society of the countries where we operate. And uh, we sometimes even become a problem for the development of those civil societies because we recruit their best people to our organizations. And I think we need to, together, invest a lot more uh, in order to allow for these mechanisms, I mentioned the Habermas interflow of communication to be also true, uh, in the consolidation of democracies and, the, and, and in the development of democracies in the countries we operate. And we need to invest much more in uh, independent, strong NGOs uh, at national level and at regional level, able to do part of the job that, to be honest, we are doing now. And this is a challenging thing for us all to recognize, that, uh, that we need to give them space and help them build themselves, even knowing that that will represent a uh, reduction of our business. I mean, yeah. to make it, uh, to cut a long story short. Uh, and this is probably where I believe as uh, international organizations, both UN, NGOs, I don't know very well about the Red Cross, the Red Crescent Society, because I think they are more specialized in, in their area. But that is where I believe we have failed more uh, uh, until now, uh, is to build up st uh, the civil society more strongly in the countries where we operate, especially those countries that have more fragile democratic institutions. I think one, one thing about our movement is, I don't want to call it a naivete, but I would feel as in the sense of how can we increase human potential, how can we make a difference out there, and you've painted a very, complex and I would think very accurate picture, but where are the places where we see some po possible optimism? Is there, where are the places where we could push, where we see a movement uh, that we could build perhaps uh, and try to begin to counter some of these enormous forces that are arrayed against us? Well, I think, uh, and this is true for the humanitarian field, but I think it's true in, in a more general I think that what is more positive in today's world is the fact that governments are no longer the only relevant actors when we deal with these issues. Right. And more and more, uh, with the strengthening of civil society, the use of uh, all the technologies that are available, uh, social media, many others, uh, we see uh, a complexity in the fabrics of society uh, that uh, limit it limit the capacity of governments, and especially the capacity of governments to um, uh, oppress uh, and to, um, uh, to violate human rights uh, uh, and to uh, make it difficult for uh, humanitarian principles to be respected. Uh, and this is happening, and I mean, the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening or whatever, with all its problems and the dramatic way it, it, it also proves that a certain kind of tyranny is no longer possible. Uh, and so, um, uh, this is, the, for me, the strongest hope. Linked to that hope, there is my strongest uh, concern and frustration, is that our political systems have not been able to adapt to this new environment, to the use of these new technologies, and uh, we see a bigger and bigger divorce in democracies between the political system and the general public. And this is particularly dramatic in Europe. I mean, you live uh, in the US that is a different society in the sense that it's a more open society. But in Europe today, the divorce between the political establishment and the society is becoming quite dramatic. And uh, uh, the capacity of the political establishment to take decisions, to have a strategic vision, to, uh, uh, to, to provide enthusiasm and hope to the society is considerably diminishing. So, so I, there is this, this, this duality here. On one side, the, the technology uh, evolution, the strengthening of societies is creating uh, new uh, hopes for bottom-up approaches that can be uh, very effective in addressing uh, uh, 
national and global problems. At the same time, the political establishments are becoming less and less effective in mobilizing societies to face the same problems. How this equilibrium will be established in the future is something that I don't know. Well, we're glad to be part of that uh, dynamic, at least within our own. Why don't we open this up to uh, comments or questions from the floor? There are some mics, I think, on both sides. If you just raise your hand, it will come to you. If you could just identify yourself, and then the mic will come to you. And if you could make your question short, because I'm sure there are a number of people that want to do this. If you could just move towards the front. I guess I see a few here in the front of the room. Doesn't matter. We just would want to be other. All right. Thank you very much. Should I, stand, since I am and short, maybe I should stand. Just stand and identify yourself. All right. My you name is Phil uh, Anulua. I am the president of and CEO of uh, International Emergency and Development Aid (IEDA) Relief. We are based in Houston, Texas. For sure, we are among the fewest interaction member based in the state of Texas. And uh, I'd like to thank again uh, Mr. Sam for great leadership in interaction. We joined interaction, uh, uh, I think, back in December of 2011. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all the interaction staff members, especially uh, Taina, who really worked with us. To, uh, I, was, I remember I was actually in, 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 in Port au Prince, Haiti, and trying to put this uh, uh, membership package together. Right. Now, I'll go back to uh, Mr. Guterres. I want to thank you, uh, sir, for the great leadership with the UNHCR. And I think uh, some ask a question, is there any hope? And the answer is yes. Now, I am originally from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And uh, I, was, uh, I worked in DRC under Mobutu uh, dictatorship as a human rights activist which was not an uh, easy job to do at all. And uh, it was not easy, as I say, and uh, those who had worked in the Congo can tell you something about it. And I remember fleeing Congo to seek asylum in Uganda. At that particular time, Uganda was not a best place for a human rights activist to be, especially if you are fleeing Eastern Congo under the, the RCD uh, movement, which was actually somewhat if you could by. move just to get to a question. If you sure. Uh, no, it's a quick answer. comment. Yeah. Now, I'd like to, uh, the reason why I'm trying to bring this up, I think I want to tell you exactly there's a hope. As a refugee from the DRC, I was resettled here in the U.S. through UNHCR and the YMCA International Services in Houston. And here am I today being able to provide, give back to the community, but that is actually because of the work of UNHCR. Uh, I think you talked about democracy. I want to say that uh, really to reiterate this uh, word by that democracy is, is a, a strong belief that uh, there is, there is, you see a possibility, uh, extraordinary possibilities in ordinary people. Today, because of the work of UNHCR, here am I today, and be able to work with refugees in Burkina Faso, in the DRC, for example, and I want to say, especially for the U.S. government representative here, that refugees are not only a burden to U.S. government, but we are also part of the solution to problems, especially in the, in, uh, today. So thank, uh, so thank you very much for the great work, and uh, I know for sure many others will have more to say. Thank you. Thank you. I think this, this <laughs> we, we go to this issue of, uh, we talk about nation states, but ultimately it comes down to one human being, because we are all that one human being. And I think that's a beautiful story for, for UNHCR, an example of this. So there's another question right back If I may say yeah, two I things about like this. this. One, first, what's amazing about the work we try to do, uh, I don't dare to say the work we do, because uh, I mean, that would be too ambitious, but the work we try to do is that, I mean, we need to give the same amount of attention to a crisis like uh, Syria or the RC, and to an individual situation of someone uh, facing uh, persecution uh, and uh, uh, needing support. Uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, the, the not because we deal so much with statistics and figures that one thing that is, for me, very 
um, uh, reassuring that we don't miss the perspective is that our mandate forces us to act with every single individual case that, that requires our support. So thank you very much for your observation on that. But if I may say something, you come from the DRC. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the most dramatic situations the international community now faces is exactly the Eastern DRC. And if there is a place where the absence of the state, the lack of consensus about the, uh, among the neighbors, and the failures of the uh, uh, UN response capacity, one of the places in the world where the impact has been more dramatic in the suffering of people, and namely uh, in relation to, for instance, women and uh, uh, sexual violence and all, is Eastern DRC. And it would be the very important for us all to think of, uh, th now there is a new Security Council resolution and I doubt that this will be the solution of the problem, but in any case, uh, 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 it would be important for political, uh, people with political responsibility to discuss with uh, international organizations, NGOs, how is the international community able to handle situations like the Eastern DRC, where we see things going on and on and on and on and on with a dramatic level of suffering and without the capacity to properly handle it and to create the conditions for it to be solved. Hi, my name is Sarah Williamson, and I'm the director of Protect the People, training and capacity building for protection initiatives. And I want to ask you, Mr. High Commissioner, to address the recent advocacy that you and other heads of UN agencies did for Syria, uh, the Enough videos and campaign. And I'm wondering if you can speak to the impact of that message that you've sent, um, that enough is enough. and if you can also address what you hope the outcome will be from that collective advocacy. Well, allow me to be a bit cynical. Um, I, I think that there has been a lot of attention to the Syrian crisis. Uh, because, first of all, because of the media. They are all there and uh, many of the news around the world, probably now a little bit less than a few months ago, open with Syria. And when we do things like the ones we have been doing, uh, both uh, in the UN and in the NGO movement or the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, uh, uh, drawing the attention uh, to the Syrian crisis, there is an impact in, uh, in, in the global media and there is an impact. And uh, I think this is something that the world is clearly aware of. But um, I'm going to, again, if you allow me to be a little bit cynical, for the world to be able to move, and the world has until now been paralyzed in the political response to the Syrian crisis, for the world to be able to move, it will not be enough to see people dying, it will not be enough to see people fleeing, it will not be enough to be women and children being victims of the most horrible things. The world will only react when people will get convinced that their own security will be at risk. And my belief is that today, Syria became a global threat for peace and security. And that is why I think that the world will be probably more motivated to act in the near future. Um, uh, not only the region, uh, I mean, you see Iraq already, the Sunni-Shia divide getting uh, much more uh, violent. You see Lebanon in a, 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 with an existential threat. You see Jordan in a very difficult situation in, in, in an area that is, uh, um, uh, of extreme importance for the global economy and for global stability. But you see fighters going into Syria from all over the world. I had a, me a meeting with the ministers of home affairs of Europe in January. My objective was to allow for the European borders to be open, to remain open, and for Europe to take more people from the region. But the main concern of the Minister of Interior was not the refugees from Syria, was the number of Europeans that are going to Syria to fight. Uh, and, uh, and there are people going to Syria to fight from Malaysia to Morocco. And, uh, and, and obviously they are now going into Syria when they, they will come back. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, political leaders in the world need to be aware that this Syrian crisis is not only the, the, the most dramatic one since I mean, the Cold War ends, it is the biggest global threat to peace and security we are facing at the present moment. And I hope that when people will get convinced of that, 
they will no, not only be able to provide much more support, and the U.S. has been by far the leading supporter of the humanitarian cause, support humanitarian agencies, and, but, but to be able to be much more proactive in addressing the political problems that the Syrian crisis uh, is uh, um, demonstrating in Syria itself and in the countries around. Thank you. Got one over here. Or I guess I have one over here, then we'll come back over here. I want to thank you for having us today and for allowing us to interview you. I do have one question. I see a lot of help for people in areas that are you know, blind and disabled, but one problem is deafness. I don't see any education for deafness in countries outside of the United States. You help people in wheelchairs who are, who are blind and you know, other countries are really uh, big on um, advocating for those folks, but I don't see anything for deafness, especially young girls you find that they typically get pregnant and at a very young age and um, they, they need to be educated about their womanhood. Thank you. Next question goes about deafness and disabilities. Yeah. No, I think, um, to be entirely honest, that uh, in emergency response, um, uh, we still lack the capacity and sometimes the the needs are so overwhelming and the, uh, the, the urgency is so dramatic that we really uh, lack the capacity. I'm, I, I'm absolutely sure about UNHCR, but I believe it's, uh, it's, it's a general problem of the humanitarian community to address the needs of uh, uh, a lot of people with specific problems. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 we are not doing enough in relation, uh, you mentioned, um, deafness, but I mean, we, we could speak about other uh, similar problems and, and the, the need to address those particular needs of people and to provide them with a, 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 an adequate environment to, to address uh, uh, the, their, their specific uh, problems. Uh, uh, th this is also true in relation to psychosocial support, victims of trauma, the capacity to respond to that. I mean, look at the Syrian situation. Uh, uh, the, the, all these, uh, and half of the people coming out of Syria is, uh, is, 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 is children. And most of these children have been deeply traumatized by violence. And we have not the capacity on the ground to respond to that massively. I mean, there, there are uh, several initiatives, there are several things that are being done, but I mean, the, 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 it's, it's overwhelming in relation to our capacity to respond. And uh, as I said, in an emergency, we tend to address the basic needs that are common, but uh, we sometimes are very, uh, very ineffective uh, or because we don't have the capacity or the resources, but also sometimes we don't even pay sufficient attention uh, to the specific situations of specific groups that need a specific investment in order to uh, fully take into account their dignity, and uh, um, uh, the, the response to, to, uh, to, 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 to the, the particular challenges they face in these difficult environments. Thank you. So I have hands up here. Is there a mic? We'll go back and forth. Uh, my name is Gabe Surumi, and I'm a vice chair of uh, JANIC. Uh, JANIC is the very similar organization, networking and, you know, organization like Interaction in Japan. And also the, I am uh, acting as a uh, uh, CEO of Plan uh, International Japan. And first of all, you know, I really appreciate uh, everybody in this hall uh, uh, to support uh, at, at the occasion of 3-11, you know, tsunami and uh, earthquake two years back. And uh, uh, we are, all of us, you know, working very hard in for the reconstruction work. I have uh, two questions uh, to, to uh, uh, you. That's the, as a UNHCR, uh, we have uh, another two years to go till 2015, MDG's goal. And what kind of, you know, action plan do you have till 2015? to maximize the uh, achievement of 2015. 
Second question is the what kind of as mo what kind of most important agenda do you have? You know, as a post you know MDGs, post MDGs agenda. That's my two questions. Well, first of all, uh, we are not in the center of the uh, uh, response to the need to. Uh, make the MDGs uh, become a reality in 2015 because we deal with very specific groups. What we try uh, is uh, 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 in all areas, for instance, we are now making an effort to increase our capacity in education where, to be honest, we were doing far from enough and we are still doing far from enough. So uh, it's, uh, uh, we, we try to have those objectives uh, uh, in our own action but let's be clear, uh, we are relatively marginal in uh, the international community's efforts to address the MDG, uh, the MDG uh, uh, challenge in, in order to be able to, uh, to be successful in the biggest possible number of countries in reaching the MDGs in 2015. Uh, in the post-2015 agenda, I must confess I am a little bit worried and I'm going to explain why. The MDGs were a, uh, I mean, let's be honest, the MDGs are not a perfect development strategy. No, I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at what is a comprehensive development plan for a country, it's not just the MDGs. But the MDGs played an extremely important role because from the marketing point of view, it was an extremely successful product. It could mobilize the attention of uh, 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 the international community and it, 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 it generated dynamics to achieve it because it was quantifiable, it was clear, uh, it was simple, it was understandable. Um, what, what I'm afraid is that when we move now into the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, that we lose that focus and that we try to do a perfect document that is so perfect that has no uh, focus and uh, that will not be able to mobilize the international actors with the same uh, commitment. So my, what, what for me is more important now in the post-2015 agenda is to make sure that we come not with a typical document that helps, uh, that is uh, uh, acceptable for every country in the world and that in the end means very little but that we are able to have the same punch that was behind the MDG approach. And I'm not sure we are going into that direction. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm afraid that we might be heading to a, a very uh, comprehensive uh, set of goals, but done in such a way that they do not uh, represent a very effective tool to mobilize the efforts and a very measurable one to make sure that uh, uh, accountability uh, is, is possible to achieve. So my main objective in relation to the SDG is not any specific SDG, is to make sure that we don't move into business as usual in the development agenda. You've now heard why it is uh, somewhat daunting and somewhat impressive this table from Antonio Guterres when he looks at these challenges and why, at least from where I sit, uh, it is easy to actually have significant confidence in the leadership and some of the leadership we see coming out of the UN. So I would like to please have you uh, join me in thanking uh, the High Commissioner for joining us and working from far forward.